Okay, it's 12.30, so let's uh, begin here. Assignment number three is due October 12th at noon. Uh, during our next class on October 4th, uh, we will spend some time reviewing for the exam that is on October 6th. So during this review, uh, I will review what I have said earlier about the exam. Also, I will give you some more details about what to expect on the exam. Uh, this time will also give you an opportunity to ask me questions. So if you have questions over the material or uh, the format of the exam, please make sure that you bring them to our next class. Uh, do note that, as I mentioned before, you will be using these computers in this room. They have SAS on it. Uh, at least right now, SAS still doesn't work. You might remember me mentioning that a few days ago. Um, I really hope it will work by next week. Uh, they're supposed to be looking at the computers again after our class here today uh, to figure out what's going on. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this, but uh, basically uh, there's no enhanced editor on, in SAS on any of these computers, which will make it difficult for you to do the test. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, what I've asked for is for them to get everything done by our class on October 4th so that during that class or after that class, you will have an opportunity to log on to these computers and just familiarize yourself about well, where to find SAS. And, um, you know, a, a common problem that I've had in the past with, with students taking a computer-based test is they don't know how to read in a data set which makes me wonder if they've done any studying beforehand uh, or reran any of my programs beforehand. But obviously, if you can't read in a data set into the statistical software package that you're using, it can be hard to do any kind of calculations. So I don't want you to be suffering for like 10 minutes before you raise your hand and say, Chris, I can't read in the data set. Can you help me? Make sure, hopefully this will occur then during our next class period, that you can read in a data set on these computers. Okay. Also, just make sure you're familiarized. You can run any kind of SAS work just to make sure it works. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay. Are there any questions before we begin? Okay, uh, last time we started talking about LaTeX. Um, I just want to reveal a little bit um, about LaTeX and why we are using it. Now, again, LaTeX is basically a programming language that can be used to produce reports, other kinds of things that you've done before with word processing software. So in the end, you write a program in using LaTeX language, you say LaTeX, then go create a PDF. And so what it does, it actually compiles your code. And then if, if your code is correct, it will shoot back to you a PDF. Now, people usually do not refer to LaTeX as a word processing software. For one reason, obviously, you're writing code rather than simply using Word and you know, getting what you see is what you get, essentially. Um, instead, people often refer to LaTeX as a typesetting uh, software package. Now, the word typesetting, you know, its original use was meant, you know, back in the olden days when we had printing presses where you had to actually have movable type, where, you know, you actually had like a, you know, a metal, let's say, letter A, and people would put this metal A on a plate and put other letters on the plate, put some ink on the plate, and then through the printing press, you somehow get a piece of paper applied to that plate, and there you have your printed copy of whatever you're trying to do. And so by actually putting these actual pieces of, of letters, you could say, on this plate, that was called type setting. Well, LaTeX is a, an electronic type setting software package. Um, where, and the reason why it's called that is because you know, 
you are trying to tell LaTeX how to put sentences, letters, words onto a printed page. And you do that through code. So that's why people refer to LaTeX as a typesetting package. Um, now, again, the reason why we're, we're looking at LaTeX is so that we can actually get to Lix. So again, Lix is going to provide to you a word-like interface to using LaTeX. And so what we're doing here today, um, and hopefully just today, but we won't have to do it anymore after today's, we're going to be looking at the actual programming code and the actual process that one actually uses to produce a PDF through using LaTeX. So, you know, what, what we've talked about so far in terms of what you should get out of, I guess, the last um, lecture is make sure that you have an actual um, um, uh, document editor on your computer so that you can actually compile yourself, like using TechMaker with, then, of course, MCTech, to actually compile a document. Make sure that you actually try to do that yourself. So make sure you have an editor. Um, then in terms of the actual program code, if you remember, there are two parts. There's what's called a preamble, and then the, I'll just call it the main document. Where that preamble allows you to set up particular settings, like tell, to tell the tech, like, what kind of document am I creating? Am I creating a book? Am I creating an article? But it, and so, for example, you would use the document class um, statement to do that. But also you can use particular packages that allow you to do various uh, you can say extensions to a tech. We saw that like with the hyperref package. So the slash use package uh, statement is helpful. But then in the main document itself then, uh, you know, make sure you understand you know, the idea of sections and subsections and the corresponding code that goes with it. The idea of environments. Uh, LaTeX puts everything into environments. So like there's the math environment. So LaTeX knows, okay, you want some kind of mathematical expression to be actually typeset. Um, and so there's a particular set of code then that's used to tell LaTeX, hey, I have a mathematical equation. Um, and and so, so those are some of the, the main things that we talked about last time. And essentially, we are going through, I should say essentially, we are, we're going through this PDF file that was generated through a corresponding set of LaTeX code. And uh, so the actual PDF or the actual code itself is located on page 13 and 14 of your lecture notes. And we are on page 15 going through my comments. So the first comment that we're going to look at for today, oops, actually, I didn't go back to where we should be. Just to make sure you see where we're at. We got up to there last time on page 15. So the first comment that we're going to investigate is a cross reference. Okay. So many times when you're doing a technical document, uh, you need to, let's say, refer back to a particular equation, like equation one. Or you might need to refer back to section three in your document. And while you could simply type section, space, the number three, that's not a, a good thing to do because, you know, what happens if you decide to change your document and you inserted another section above section three? So now what was section three now becomes section four. And if you had just typed section three before, now you have to change the three to the four. And imagine many, many times in the document where you, you do that kind of stuff and you're always going to have to go back and make changes. That's a poor way to write a technical document. Instead, what you need to do is make sure the document automatically updates section numbers, equation numbers itself. This is how you can do this in LaTeX. 
So in my, let me actually just show you in the PDF first. Okay. So in my PDF document itself, you notice how I have this reference to section 3. I did not type section space 3 in my document. Rather, I typed section, and then I made a cross-reference. In what's called in LaTeX a cross-reference to a particular section, which just so happens to be right now section 3. Well, how did I do that? Okay, the first thing that you need to do, so section 3 right now is the proposed methodology section. And so to be able to refer to this in a dynamic manner, a manner, I should say, is I need to put a label there. So I'm going to say slash label, and then I just give it some name. It can be any name that you want. I chose a simple name, label for section. <laughs> Obviously, in, in a real situation, we would want to make that more descriptive, but this is just a simple example here. And so then what I need to do then is cross-reference that label when I want to say in section 3 in the actual PDF. How do I do that? Well, in, in the simulation study section, when I do this, I say in section, and then here is how I do the cross-reference, slash ref. And then in the curly brackets, I put the exact name for that label. So now, when I create the PDF, you will see in section 3 there. And if I were to actually insert, just for emphasis, sorry if I'm repeating myself, if I were to re, uh, you know, put in a new section above section 3, so that section 3 then becomes section 4, LaTeX will automatically update to section 4. Okay. A similar process is done also for equations as well, for labeling equation numbers. Uh, we'll talk about that in, in, uh, in um, more so when we do uh, LITs. Any questions? Okay. What about tables? So I have a very simple table here. It's a two by three table. Notice the last column purpose is empty. Because sometimes in tables, you know, you will want to have a, some empty cells. Um, I just did this here for demonstration purposes, and I just simply put A, B, C, D as the cell entries for the other cells. Well, how can you do cell? Uh, how can you do tables in LaTeX? The code simply sucks, to be honest. Uh, but this is what it looks like. I have to use the tabular environment. So notice I do begin tabular, end tabular, and everything inside of it says I'm producing a table. The first thing I need to do is set up how many columns are going to be in the table. Notice how I do this. Within curly brackets, I do a vertical line to mean, okay, this is where the f you're going to have a, a, a essentially a, a vertical line to begin the table. And then I have an L to say that first column, everything inside there is going to be left aligned. So I could do C, I could do R, or center, or right aligned. Um, and then I have another vertical line to say, hey, this is now the next line in my table. And now for the second column, I also want that left aligned and then so on. So now I've created the column structure. At the top of my table in the PDF you'll see a, a horizontal line. How did I do that? Slash H line. Horizontal line. Then I can finally get into well, what's going to be inside the rows. So for the first row, first column, A. Then to separate the first row, first column from the first row, second column, I use an ampersand for meaning like and. So I have A in the first cell, and then I have B in the second cell. In the last cell of that row, remember how it was empty? How do I get that? Use a tilde. Then to say, hey, I am done with row one, a double slash. Of course, I want a horizontal line to be at the bottom of row one, and then I do 
row 2 in a similar manner. That's how you can do tables in the tech. There are actual, uh, I guess you could say maybe applets online where you can more easily say, I want a 2 by 3 table with this content, and it will spit out then the LaTeX code for you, so you don't have to do it yourself. In the end, it's not worth me showing you that because we're going to be using Lix, and Lix will allow you to create a table similar to what you can do in Word. But still, it's helpful to know the process of what's being done. Oops. Okay, so you might remember in the document last time I said we were going to skip something that was in the preamble, and now we're going to talk about it. It's this is right here. Okay. There are ways where you can create, let's say, um, shortcut symbols or shortcut words to mean something that's more complicated. And this isn't the best example in the world, but I think you can get the idea. So first of all, slash bar tilde y uh, n tilde, did I say tilde? Slash bar curly left bracket y right curly bracket. That can be actually used in a math environment. What do you think that will produce if I use that in a math environment? Y bar. So like the sample mean. Okay. And let's say having to type it like that was just too much for you. And you wanted to, to be able to type something else so that automatically when you type this something else, you will always get Y bar. Well, that something else is going to be slash Y bar. So slash Y bar is my, you can say my shortcut statement to get this mathematical symbol. How do I do that? In the preamble. I use slash new command. I have a new command. It's going to be called slash y bar. Whenever I use it, it's going to mean you know, sample mean, essentially. Well, now, how do I use this? Well, in my actual main part of my document, then, I again say I, have, I need something in my math environment, and I do slash y bar. And I get what I want. So again, in other situations where maybe you have a more complicated expression that Maybe you have to use multiple times. This can be helpful to do this little shortcut. Okay. So, so, you know, one big difference between Word and LaTeX. Big, huge difference. Let's say if I start, I accidentally leaned on my keyboard. And I have a whole bunch of spaces in there. Now, when I create the PDF, which we'll talk about shortly, what do you think LaTeX is going to do? Is it going to put a whole bunch of spaces in there, as you would see in Word? No, it won't. It will still separate out the A from the normal with one space. Because, you know, realistically, why would you ever want to do that? Why would you ever want to put in a whole bunch of spaces between words? Now, there may be times for some reason that you would want to, and guess what? There's a LaTeX function that will allow you to do that. Also, let's say I decided, oh, I want a whole bunch of lines, you know, uh, empty lines in my PDF between A and normal for some reason. Well, when LaTeX compiles this, similar to those spaces, it will ignore those empty lines. Because in a realistic setting, why would you want to do that? Again, there may be cases where you would want to, and there are particular uh, statements in LaTeX that will allow you to do that. Uh, I think it's slash V space. Is there a question? I, I saw that maybe, okay. So this is an example, though, of how you lose some of the control that you may be used to in Word. You know, let's say for some reason you always wanted to indent two spaces every line. You lose that control. What controls it? What controls everything is that right there. Your document class. Also, depending upon what packages you use, that will also control the style of what your document is going to look like. 
So you lose control. And this is obviously both good and bad. You know, for those of us who control freaks, you want to be able to do anything that you want, well, you, you've lost it. But think of a particular setting, you know, where, you know, there is a required format that you need to use for a report or like a journal article, for example, or like a book. Well, this helps then that publisher or whomever is actually you're submitting this report to actually allows them to control what it's going to look like by specifying a certain document class or a set of packages. Okay. Are there any questions about that? Okay, so let's talk about now how do I produce that PDF? Again, this is computer code that I'm gender I am writing here. It's a computer program. I need to compile that program, send it to essentially MCTEC, MCTEC's going to look it over to make sure there's no programming errors. And if there's no programming errors, then it's going to produce a PDF of the document that you want. The way that you do that is in every programming editor for LaTeX, there's usually some kind of button that you can simply click on that will produce the PDF. In this particular case in TechMaker, it's this arrow here. And notice it says Quick Build next to it. Basically, it's going to quickly build a PDF for us talk more about what actually happened shortly. So I'm going to click on that. Notice it said run when I moused over it. And look what came up. My PDF opened up in MCTEC itself. Let's see if I can... no. There we go. Now actually what happens is, and if I go to there on my hard drive, It actually created that file right there. First dot PDF, you know, it's at 12.51 p.m., which is right about now. So it actually physically wrote a, a file to your hard drive, a PDF document. Now, typically, I'm not really interested in looking at it in the, in the editor itself, because you can see it's hard to see both at the same time in terms of just, you know, how big your screen is. So I usually just leave this closed. Close it, and I will just physically open it up this way and take a look at it to make sure it, the document looks correct. And then one disadvantage of, of, of using LaTeX over Word is, let's say you do find an error. You know, it doesn't look like what you wanted. Well, you can't just simply go in the PDF and make that change like you would like in Word. So you have to go back to LaTeX, change the code, compile it, open up the PDF, look to see if it's correct. If it's not. Go back to LaTeX or TechMaker, change the code, and you go back and forth just like you would with a regular computer program. This makes you know, writing documents sometimes longer because of that process than what you would have in Word. Um, and do note that if I were to compile this document again to produce a PDF, I need to make sure that, that is closed. Otherwise, TechMaker will say, can't do that. Some program editors with LaTeX will not automatically open it up on this right hand side like what we saw. They might not have a, a PDF viewer inside of it. Instead, the only way that you would be able to view the PDF is essentially the way I did it, is actually find it on your hard drive. Note that where it did put it on my hard drive is in the exact same spot that I have my .tech file. On page 16 in the notes, I show for two other programming editors where you can find the correct button to push to create, create a PDF to do the compilation. Are there any questions? Do you need all those extra, like, first.angux? Yeah, I was just going to get to that. Thank you. So, so TechMaker, and as does every other program editor, um, uh, produces some additional files. Some of the, actually, some of these are actually produced by MCTEC, not TechMaker itself. But in the end, you get a, whole, a number of additional files. And so, for example, we see this log file here. Let me actually open it up. Let's see. So I'm open up in this little editor called TinR. This is actually what we will use to do programming in R, or at least I will. Um, and what this is essentially is like the log window for uh, sets. It tells you, was there an error? 
you know, how did things go when you were compiling it. Um, do note that it is not user friendly to read or to figure out errors that are occurring, which is a shame. Um, some of these other files, like uh, for example, this dot out, it's produced by MIGTEC, and you can kind of get an idea of what it's doing. It's kind of giving an outline of your document. Now, these particular files will be generated every time that you compile your .tech, your .tech file to a PDF. And oftentimes what these files are used for by MCTEC is it will put, let's say, additional information that it uses to create particular parts of the PDF. One big example of where this occurs is, let's say, if you have a bibliography. So you have a list of references at your end of your document. Latech, or MCTEC if I want to be more specific, will put a whole bunch of information into one of these files that contains the bibliography information. And then, so that will happen after you compile your document. And then, after it produces that, that extra information to one of these files, you have to actually compile your document again so that MGTEC will actually recognize parts of your bibliography. It's kind of a frustrating thing that, uh, especially to new users of LaTeX, that you, in order to produce the PDF that I want, I have to actually compile a computer program twice, not just once. Why, why isn't LaTeX smart enough to do it itself? I don't know. <laughs> um, so let's take a look at this quick build here. So basically that, that, that right arrow for run, corresponds to whatever you have highlighted over here in terms of it asks how do you want to run this computer program that you've just written. And quick build corresponds to under options, configure tech maker, quick build. It tells me exactly what happens when I do this, when I do a quick build at this moment. It goes to PDF LaTeX, meaning it produces a PDF. Then it goes to BibTech. BibTech actually deals with bibliographies. Obviously, we don't have that here, but in other documents, you will. Then it runs PDF LaTeX again, similar to what I just told you. And then finally, it allows you to view the PDF in TechMaker itself. So alternatively, something that you could do instead is just run PDF LaTeX directly. And if I did that, it would just, it would just produce that first PDF that we saw on that, that list of... Um, uh, things that were happening in Quick Build, it would just produce the PDF, and that's it. It won't open it up in the browser, in, 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 in TechMaker. Okay, so that takes us to page 17. Well, what would happen if you use a different document class? Well, the document classes are set up for the type of document that you want. So, for example, well, you should try this on your own. Change the word article in the document class first line of my code to book. And you'll see some changes to what the PDF is that's produced. Because, for example, in a book you will often have chapters. So now, um, um, LaTeX gives you the ability to use a different environment called slash chapter in addition to still having slash section, slash subsection. Other types of um, document classes may not, I don't know off, any off the, off the top of my head, but I would imagine that probably some exist, might not even have the ability to use slash section or slash subsection because of the nature of the particular document. So some resources to use to learn more about LaTeX. I won't talk about them all. I'll just focus on a few. So Marie Davidian is probably one of the most well-known statisticians right now. Uh, she's a professor at North Carolina State. Um, she usually has some good course websites that has all her lecture notes out there. And in particular, a course that she taught a number of years ago was NC State's Preparation for Statistical Research course. Um, this was a, this is a course 
still, she doesn't necessarily teach it, uh, that uh, basically like first year PhD students will take. And one of the things that they focus on that course is an introduction to LaTeX. Talk about math type. So I talked about math type a little bit last time. Now, math type is actually set up to work with um, uh, the, the code that you, you would use in LaTeX to do equations. So for example, <clears throat> okay, so I have just a simple empty Word document here. I'm going to bring up the math type editor. And if I turn on a particular option, which I've already done, and type, and then now I can type actual uh, LaTeX code. So if I do slash alpha, I get the alpha. With Word's latest equation editor, it allows you to do a similar thing too if you haven't uh, noticed it yet. Also, if I were to, let's say, copy that code outside of math type and into Word, look what happens. It produces the math type code. Again, I have to turn on a particular option for that to occur, but it's a nice thing to do. And so, especially if you had a, if you were just simply using LaTeX alone, and you had a complicated equation, it would be a lot easier to do it in math type than it would to uh, do it uh, necessarily in just um, LaTeX itself. I, I want to emphasize here, while I generated this alpha using math type code, I'm sorry, using LaTeX code, um, you know, let's say if I just did, oh, we'll just find another one there. I, I, I inser inserted a chi with just using a cut or copy uh, with, um, with using the template up here. Now, if I copy this outside of, of, of math type, I get the same thing. So it's not just because I was writing the tech code why I got the slash on. Okay, any questions? Okay, let's uh, talk about more about specific ways that statisticians and people in other disciplines too uh, use LaTeX. In, in particular for journals, you know, let's say you wanted to write a paper. At some point, well, many of you will be doing this, this in your careers. Uh, every stat journal out there is either going to have uh, is going to have a, a set of LaTeX files to allow you to put your LaTeX created document into their specific journal format. Everyone will have that. And the type of files that they will have out there are style files, .sty files. These correspond to the files that you can use with slash use package. So we talked about how you know the um, there's this LaTeX website that you can download these packages from automatically. Well, sometimes uh, you can use essentially a package that's given to you in a style file that's created by in this case a journal. And so we'll look at some examples of that shortly. And you just simply you download that style file to your computer, put that style file in exactly the same directory as your .tech file, and then so that when you compile your document, as long as you use slash use package, that corresponding style file, LaTeX finds that style file and, and, and takes advantage of it. So we've talked a lot about document classes. Well, many journals create their own document class. And then they distribute to you a particular file that contains all the information about that document class. And so when you do slash document class, you put the corresponding file name uh, that the um, uh, journal gave you. And there's similar things with bibliography style files too, which we will not talk about until we get to a list. Um, Okay, let's. I have two examples. Uh, I'll just show you this to help explain it better. So, my very first time that I was the first 
author, meaning I'm the one who's doing all the typing of a particular journal paper, or paper for a journal, um, that, re that was done in LaTeX, was a paper that I did, that was published in 2010, but I probably wrote it in 2009. Uh, it, was, it was for the journal, uh, the, the R journal. So this is a nice journal out there that, uh, uh, that allows people who, for example, write what's called an R package, like some kind of extension to R to do a particular statistical set of statistical methods. It allows them uh, to discuss their contribution in a paper format. It's a regular referee journal, meaning that there are people who evaluate whether or not it is worthy this paper to be in the journal. Um, there are editors that make uh, acceptance and rejection decisions. And so, so anyway, I typed this, uh, I, I put together this paper. And the reason why I use LaTeX is because it was required. They wouldn't publish it otherwise. I had to submit a paper in this format. Um, most journals do not make that requirement. Usually they, they say, we greatly prefer, like a LaTeX farm, um, but they require it. And the ones that typically are the ones that require it are the journals that have open access because they do not pay, uh, let's say, um, they will not pay someone to take your Word document and retype it in a LaTeX format because they are open access. They don't have any money coming in to support that kind of operation. So they will require you to submit a LaTeX document that allows them to easily then put it into their own journal's format. Okay. Now with all these journals, they will have some information to the authors about, well, how to submit. And, you know, the details here are not important, but I just did a little screen capture of what it, what it used to look like back in about 2010. And if you notice here, they have a particular LaTeX style file that they want you to use. And what this style file will do is actually put the doc, your, your LaTeX code in the actual format that you will see in the journal in terms of the style. So, for example, this is the, the actual paper, uh, what it looks like after I compile the document. And the, 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 the changes that they simply make in terms of like the, the journal itself, is that they'll come down here and they'll change, well, what journal volume is it? Otherwise, it's ready, pretty much ready to go. They might change some of your wording at times. You know, look, this is a good, good example, but you know, some journals that are, let's say, uh, based upon British English versus an American English, they'll change it to a British English, well, they'll change my writing to a British English format rather than an American English format. That's okay. So notice here in this document how it is two columns. Um, and this is automatically done based upon the style file that they gave me. Now also what this journal does, and you see this often in many journals too, is that they'll give you a .tech file as well that basically you can put in your content into certain areas inside that .tech file. And they'll have everything else set up for you so that it recognizes the style file. It maybe does some other stuff that's needed as well. This journal was a little bit different in that you had what they call a wrapper file. And the template file is where you actually type your content itself. And so what this is like is similar to what I was talking about uh, a few weeks ago with SAS. Remember the percent include um, macro function? Very often in SAS, when you have a very long SAS program, the way that people write their SAS code is that they'll have like a, a master program or a control program that simply calls out other like child programs uh, that contain certain parts of, of, of what you want you know, done in terms of the statistical method. So I gave you an example of 
a control program that I use in my own research. And that control program called out another program that does some bootstrapping, another program that does some stuff that's based upon some asymptotic approximations for a distribution, and then another program that does uh, some data generation and stuff like that. And the way that I include these child programs in this program here is to use a percent include macro function. Well, in a similar manner, they have this like control program here that they call a wrapper program or wrapper.tech file. And then the child is, is, is this RJ template. Okay. So let's take a look at those files. So here's the wrapper one. Notice the document class is report. Why did they choose that? I don't know exactly, but there are two options for that they specify. The paper size option, and also they want two columns, as you saw in that PDF. Then, slash use package our journal. What does that correspond to? That corresponds to this style file right there. So if we take a look at my actual folder on my computer, where I have everything stored, you can see there's that style file. Now I should mention, too, do I know how to write one of these style files? Do I know how to write a document class file? No. Do any of my colleagues that have used LaTeX for even more years than me know how to write those files? No. How many statisticians know how to write these files? Probably very few. These files are, are you know, I don't, I mean, you can, we can take a look at the, the code in one of these files. I have one open. So this is all the code associated with one of these files. And, yeah, I can get a general idea of what's going on, but, you know, I, I couldn't write one of these myself. Which, again, for someone who likes to have control over everything, I find that as, um, uh, I don't like. <laughs> I, I would like to know exactly what's going on here. Um, but, you know, there are LaTeX programming experts out there that can create these files. So, for example, uh, one place, one person that I know who, who can write one of these files is someone by the name of Sashi. Uh, Sashi was a LaTeX programming expert that I worked with on my book. So my publisher of my, my categorical data analysis book, CRC Press, they have a LaTeX help desk to help their authors with various things dealing with LaTeX because they want people to use LaTeX. And so this help desk was actually located in India. And so I would, I would email Sashi with my questions and Sashi would get back with me uh, regarding um, uh, the various answers. Um, anyway, the whole experience of, of communicating with someone halfway around the world I found quite interesting uh, to begin with because, you know, you can't just email this person at 2 p.m. and expect to answer right back because they're sleepy. <laughs> so without going into all the details, I would often not email Sashi until like 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. at night because I knew it was about 10 a.m., 11 a.m. Uh, there in India. And so then in the hopes that he would get back to me quickly and so that we could have a conversation going on via email, like every 15 minutes rather than necessarily every 12 hours. Um, anyway, he, he was very helpful. Okay, so, so these style files, I hate to say, it's something that I don't know exactly how to do myself. And I don't know many people who do. Now, here it also, uh, now this isn't code that I wrote. This is code that the journal wrote itself. It also uses the NatBib uh, package, which allows you to do some stuff with bibliographies. Since it's, this is not a particular file that's located in my hard drive, it wasn't one that they gave uh, me to download. That is NatBib.sty. What LaTeX is going to do when it compiles this document is go to the uh, LaTeX website and download it if it's not already on your computer to begin with. And then, you know, the main thing that's of interest, begin article, end article. This input, 
works like the include, state, uh, the include function in SAS. So my main document that contains all my content is this particular document here. This is just the names of the last uh, of the, of the um, last names of the people who are co-authors on this paper with me. And so what this represents then, oops, is basically I took this particular file right here, changed the name, and then I started adding my content. So let's take a look at that file. And there we go. So you know, we've seen make title before. This takes title, author information, organize it the way that the style file says to do it. Then in this style file, there is an environment called abstract, which then this is where I type my abstract and it formats it in the correct way or the desired way by that uh, particular journal. Sorry, let me just find it. So it, it organizes it like this. Notice how you have indentation, uh, you have abstract bolded, all that would be in the, the style file. Then, notice I begin a section, the introduction section, and I could just type like, like normal. Now, in the, and sorry I didn't mention this before, so notice that you see instructions for authors. So if I click on that, I get a, a PDF file that will pop up that contains all this information about uh, some helpful hints about how to use the style file um, for, for authors. So for example, there is a, a, a statement called slash code that allows you with their style file to put our code in the correct format that they want. You know, typically when any, anybody ever actually writes computer code like, like in lecture notes for example, you've seen this. I always use a courier like font because that's just a standard and the reason being is because every letter, every character is exactly the same width and very often when you're writing computer code you want that uh, so that you get stuff lined up from one line to the next as, as you would like. So we have a slash code. We have an environment that they created called example. So let's take a look at where I use that in my LaTeX code. Let's see here. So slash code. So there's a particular function in R called GLM and it's going to format it in the correct way that they want. So if I take a look at my document here, let's see, find it right there. So if you see where my mouse is, there is, you can see in a courier-like font, GLM. Let's go to an example. So here's where I use the example environment. So I can have a larger code example here. Notice how I end the environment as well. This is actual R code here. And this is the corresponding output that was produced by R. If we take a look at it in the PDF document, it's right here. If you see where my mouse is, you can see how everything's nicely formatted. Okay. Are there any questions? So I do want you to go through this document just so you get an idea of what's going on. Try to compile it. Well, hopefully it will work for you. Um, and this is, I think, just a good example. So in this next example, get to that. So this next example comes from a biometrics paper. At the time, biometrics, and I've submitted a number of papers to biometrics in the past. Um, and I've submitted in, as Word documents. Uh, this particular paper was uh, created by uh, a colleague of mine, Chris McMahon. This was one of the papers he came up with from his dissertation. Chris is now a professor at Clemson University. Josh Tebbs there, uh, that's uh, also a colleague of mine. Uh, 
uh, that I do a lot of my research with is at the University of South Carolina. And biometrics at this time um, uh, still allow people to do Word documents, but they greatly encourage you to use LaTeX documents. And so as part of doing Chris's dissertation, he learned, he taught himself how to use LaTeX. So he could submit it. Now they actually do require uh, LaTeX documents for submission. Uh, Biometrics itself is one of the one of the top tier journals for statistics. Um, typically everyone agrees that there are five top tier journals in statistics. Biometrics, Biometrica, Journal of the Royal Statistical Society Series B, Annals of Statistics, and Journal of the American Statistical Association. If you get a paper in one of those journals, you're happy. Um, and so this is a very high quality journal. Uh, and, you know, they have these requirements regarding uh, LaTeX. Um, we are unfortunately out of time, though, so I don't have time to go through this. I think we'll have to pick up next time on this. Are there any questions? Okay, that's it for today.